You are listening to The Yangtze Incident, Britain's Last Battle in China, researched, written and narrated by Mark Felton. Episode 2 HMS London and Black Swan were greeted by a storm of fire. The Chinese were not intimidated by the large British cruiser and liberally plastered her and the Black Swan with both high-explosive and anti-tank shells from batteries near Bait Point. The London was holed 12 times on her port side. Her two forward 8-inch turrets and X after turret were damaged and rendered inoperable and her bridge was hit several times. The London suffered 15 killed and 30 wounded, while the Black Swan's superstructure was severely damaged, 12 men being wounded. Reluctantly, the order was given to withdraw down the river lest the London and Black Swan ended up in a similar condition to the Amethyst. This action revealed the limitations of using large warships as gunboats on a river against an enemy well armed with modern artillery. The London, for all her size and armament, just ended up as a larger target for the Chinese. Because of the narrowness of the river, she was unable to stay out of range of the Chinese guns, while hitting them with impunity with her big 8-inch main armament. The much smaller pre-war Yangtze River gunboats had never had to face such a well-armed and determined opponent as the PLA was proving to be. Captain Kasler of the London, in his captain's report of the action, noted that the vessel had fired 132 8-inch shells, as well as 449 4-inch and over 2,000 light anti-aircraft shells during the brief but very violent river battle. All damage to the ship was quickly and efficiently dealt with by the damage control parties, noted Kasler, whose performance I consider to be outstanding taking into consideration the difficulty of providing realistic training in these duties. The bearing and conduct of the ship's company, a large proportion of whom are very young and were experiencing action for the first time, was beyond praise. Kasler singled out the gun crews for particular praise. As an instance, the four-inch gun crews and supply parties suffered 38% casualties, who were not replaced as they fell. Later, on the 22nd, an RAF Sunderland flying boat flew up from Hong Kong, carrying Flight Lieutenant Michael Fernley, an Air Force doctor, and some urgently needed medical supplies. The huge white aircraft landed in the river near to the Amethyst and quickly offloaded the doctor and supplies just as the PLA opened fire. Shells landed as close as a 100 yards away from the Sunderland, and the pilot could not linger. A boat also arrived from Nanking, carrying Lieutenant Commander John Kerens, the British Embassy's assistant naval attaché, who had been ordered to assume command of the Amethyst. Some members of the crew later returned to the Amethyst on the 22nd of April. Vice Admiral A.C.G. Madden, Commander-in-Chief, Far East Station, reported to the Admiralty that the vessel had three Royal Navy officers, an RAF doctor, 52 ratings, and eight Chinese mess attendants embarked. Madden sent a message to the Amethyst. In a splendid performance by all on board ship, the work of your sole telegraphist evokes my admiration. I cannot be grateful enough to him for his help. Madden was also busy organizing assistance for the wounded crew members who were arriving in Shanghai overland. The American hospital ship USS Repose arrived off Wuzong and offered her assistance, which Madden gratefully accepted. In the meantime, the strategic situation in eastern China had changed dramatically, making the Amethyst's rescue even more perilous an undertaking. On the same day that HMS London and Black Swan attempted to rescue the Amethyst, the Communists had launched a general offensive along a 250-mile front. One column penetrated as close as 45 miles from Shanghai. Nationalist forces evacuated the town of Qingqiang, and the Shanghai to Nanking railway was cut. Qiangying Navy Base, 85 miles below Nanking on the Yangtze River, went over to the communists. 
another column threatened the city of Wuxi, 70 miles from Shanghai. By the 23rd, the battered amethyst was anchored close to Qinqiang. In Shanghai, a memorial service was held at Holy Trinity Cathedral for the 23 dead sailors who had been sent by train, and the British Residents Association started a relief fund to raise money for the dead men's dependents. On the 26th of April, the Communists occupied Nanking. There was no resistance, as the Nationalist 28th Army had already evacuated the city along with its positions on the Yangtze River. It had joined up with the 45th Army, and the 100,000 soldiers had begun to march towards Hangzhou, now Hangzhou, near Shanghai. Widespread civilian looting had broken out in the Chinese capital. While the looters were at work, reported a British newspaper, military demolition squads were blowing up the Xiaquan railway station and setting fire to ammunition dumps, aircraft and aviation fuel, lorries, jeeps, stores of weapons and river craft. Order had completely broken down. Policemen stripped off their uniforms and disappeared from the streets. Former General Ma Ching Yuan contacted the Communists and arranged them to enter once his men had brought the looting under control, and he eventually imposed some semblance of order. Over 900,000 Communist troops had crossed the Yangtze in several places, and the Amethyst was now deep inside hostile territory. The communist media had begun to report on the amethyst situation, though for propaganda purposes its reportage was distorted and inaccurate. On Wednesday, two enemy war vessels suddenly opened fire on communist positions on the north bank, ran one report. The communists returned fire and hit one of the vessels, amethyst, which subsequently sunk, while the other, consort, steamed to the west and was half sunk near Qinqiang. Then another enemy war vessel, London, steaming east from Qingqiang, reached the spot and opened fire. In Shanghai, the British Consul General, R. W. Urquhart, stated to the press, every possible means of rescuing them, either by an operation or a ceasefire order, will be taken. But in reality, the mighty Royal Navy was running out of options. Vice Admiral Madden was loath to expose any more of his vessels to shore bombardment on the river, so some other way would have to be found to obtain the amethyst release. In the meantime, the repose moved down to the Wangpu River, anchoring off the Shanghai Bund, a safe distance from communist shore batteries. American Consul General John Cabot urged the 2,500 US citizens who remained in Shanghai to leave. The U.S. Navy had enough ships to evacuate all of them before the city fell to the communists, and also space to take off many other foreigners. John Kerens was a 33-year-old Second World War veteran, and he wasted no time in organising the evacuation of the remaining wounded men and getting the amethyst seaworthy again. Soon afterwards, the PLA made contact, requesting a meeting between Lieutenant Commander Kerens and the local PLA political officer, a Colonel Kung. Kung acted as a representative for Colonel Yi Fei, the local military commander. At their first meeting on the 30th of April, Kung demanded that Kerens sign a statement. The statement said that the British admitted to having invaded Chinese territorial waters by steaming warships up the Yangtze, and having fired first on the PLA. Kerens refused, stating repeatedly that the Amethyst was going about her lawful business under the various treaties that had been signed between China and the Western powers, when she had been fired on by the PLA without warning or provocation. Naturally, Kung refused to accept this. The Communists consistently refused to recognise any of the treaties that had been made under the Qing Imperial Dynasty or those by the subsequent Nationalist government, declaring them all to be unequal and therefore unlawful. Only in 1989 did retired General Yi Fei finally admit that the PLA had fired first. Kung and Kerens found themselves at an impasse. The Chinese informed Kerens that as long as the British behaved themselves, the PLA batteries would not fire on the Amethyst, but if he tried to move the ship, they would do so. 
Karens and the Amethyst were now to be Chinese hostages, the PLA intention being to starve the crew into submission and force them to sign the face-saving admission of guilt. Karens never wavered and instead settled down to a long siege. The Amethyst remained at anchor and under PLA guns for ten weeks. The Chinese denied the vessel most supplies, but because only a small steaming party had manned the ship since the 21st of April battle and evacuation, the ship's stores were sufficient to last. The Chinese played a cat-and-mouse game with Kerens. They made demands, sometimes offered concessions, such as permitting outgoing mail or supplying oil for cooking but all the time trying to persuade or bully Kerens into signing a statement admitting that the Amethyst had opened fire first. The Chinese strategy was designed to lower the British sailors' morale, but Kerens was wise to their tricks, and he determined to make a run for Shanghai and the open sea when the opportunity presented itself. British morale was much boosted by the activities of Simon, the ship's cat, he had miraculously survived his ordeal by shellfire and had resumed his extremely useful duties killing rats aboard the stationary ship. There was a particularly large and ferocious rat on board that the crew nicknamed Mao Zedong. Mao and his followers were wreaking havoc on the ship's dwindling supplies. The crew felt that Simon in his weakened state would be no match in a one-on-one -on -one with Mao. They underestimated Simon and in a duel to the death, Mao the rat was killed. Although Kerens did not have the same affinity for the animal as the crew, Simon had nonetheless helped to prevent a disease outbreak by killing off the vermin that infested the amethyst, and his contribution to the struggle was recognised by his promotion to the rank of able sea cat. During the early hours of the 30th of July 1949, the Amethyst slipped her chain and quietly moved down river towards Shanghai, beginning a hazardous 104-mile dash for freedom. By now, the Communists had crossed the river and established gun batteries on both banks. If Kerens escape attempt was discovered, his ship would have been blown out of the water by PLA guns. Kerens's preparations had included greasing the anchor cable to deaden the noise and changing the ship's silhouette with black-painted canvas screens erected forward to confuse the Chinese gunners as to her identity. The crew were all dressed in dark colours and all white parts of the ship's superstructure had been painted out. Just before Kerens gave the order to slip, a well-lit Chinese passenger ship, the Qiangling Liberation, came around a bend in the river headed for Shanghai. She was carrying refugees. Kerens decided to follow the Qiangling, using her as a pilot to navigate the treacherous shoals. The Chinese vessel's lights would also distract the PLA gunners, leaving the blacked-out amethyst trailing in the shadows. However, this plan did not last long as the movement was spotted by the PLA and parachute flares shot into the night sky. Kerens immediately ordered full ahead both and the Amethyst surged past the Qiang Ling as the Chinese batteries opened fire. Perhaps distracted by the lights on the Qiang Ling, the Chinese gunners failed to hit the Amethyst, though she returned fire with alacrity. The unfortunate Qiang Ling was pounded by Chinese shells, caught fire and eventually sank, and an unknown number of refugees were killed. Two forts, Wu Zong and Pa Shan, had protected the entrance to the Yangtze River for over a century. They were 38 miles from the East China Sea and Shanghai. These forts, which had long history of battles with the British, mounted modern 8-inch guns. If the forts opened fire on the Amethyst, she would be destroyed. In order to help the Amethyst reach the open sea, the Admiralty ordered another C-class destroyer, HMS Concord, to enter the Yangtze and sit off the Wuzong Fort with orders to bombard it if necessary. This was a very risky action, for the Concord was only armed with 4.5-inch guns. Now that the cruiser London had been sent for urgent repairs in Hong Kong following her battering up the Yangtze, and the Concorde would have to do. But the Concorde skipper, Commander Ian Robertson, was prepared to do his duty, come what may. 
Late on the evening of the 20th of July, Concord proceeded upriver. She was challenged by a nationalist Chinese gunboat, but unmolested. The Concord anchored at 1.45am on the 21st of July, but shortly afterwards weighed and proceeded up the Yangtze for 20 miles. At 2.20am, the Concorde spoke briefly with another nationalist warship near the Dongshang Bank Boy, anchored again, and after another brief period, set off once more. The telegraphist picked up a message from the amethyst, Wuzong in sight. This was followed a little while later by Concorde in sight. The time was 5.25am, and the Concorde spotted the battered amethyst at a distance of three miles. Concord signalled the amethyst, Fancy meeting you again, to which the amethyst replied, Never, repeat never, has a ship been more welcome. Commander Kerens signalled the Admiralty, Have rejoined the fleet, no damage or casualties, God save the King. Travelling in concert, at 7.15am, the ships secured from action stations, which meant that they were no longer ready to fight and at 12.12pm the main engines rang off. They were kept at two hours' notice for steam. Concorde transferred stores and discharged 147 tonnes of fuel oil to the Amethyst. After so long under siege, the Amethyst tanks only contained seven tonnes of fuel. At 6pm, Lieutenant T.J.D. Grant was drafted onto the Amethyst on temporary loan, along with one signalman and one telegraphist. At 10 p.m. that night, the Concorde slipped from Amethyst and, in company, set off for Hong Kong. A short while later, they encountered the destroyer, HMS Cossack. Concorde was ordered to proceed on patrol, leaving the Cossack to escort the Amethyst to Hong Kong. Due to the very sensitive nature of her mission, the Concorde's logbook was taken out of service and replaced. The British were keen that there would be no trace of Concorde's invasion of the Yangtze River. This has led to the part played by Concorde's crew being minimised or ignored, even though they placed themselves at great risk under the guns at Wuzong. This would also lead to the denial to the crew of the Naval General Service Medal with Ba Yangtze 1949 that was given to the ship's companies aboard the Amethyst, London, Black Swan and Consort. Of the 46 British sailors who were killed from the Yangtze incident, 23 were buried with full military honours in Shanghai. Unfortunately, from the 1960s, their graves were desecrated and eventually completely destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. Lieutenant Commander Bernard Skinner was buried at sea off Shanghai as per the wishes of his widow in Hong Kong, while the remaining dead were buried in the Yangtze River. It was perhaps only natural that an animal-loving people like the British should seize upon the story of Simon, the ship's cat, to help them come to terms with the Amethyst disaster. Simon was lauded in both the national and international press after the Amethyst returned to Plymouth in November 1949. At each and every port that the ship visited, able sea cat Simon was lauded and honoured alongside the Amethyst's brave crewmen. He was given the premier award for animal bravery, the Dickin Medal, as well as a medal from the Blue Cross. He was also given the Naval General Service Medal alongside his shipmates. One crewman from the Amethyst was given the full-time job of responding to the thousands of letters that people from all over the world wrote to the cat. On arrival in England, Simon was placed into routine quarantine at an animal centre in Surrey but he developed an infection caused by his war wounds and died on the 28th of November. His tiny coffin, draped in the Union Jack, was interred in a cemetery in Ilford, East London. Hundreds, including the entire crew of HMS Amethyst, attended his funeral. You have been listening to The Yangtze Incident, Britain's Last Battle in China, written and narrated by Mark Felton. For short films on a wide variety of military history topics, please visit my other YouTube channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. (laughs) 